talk about the distal GU tract and the trauma that it can endure here. So this is going to be the bladder and the urethra. As far as anatomy of the bladder, uh, I guess uh, we'll point to three major landmarks. Uh, so we have, of course, the bladder here, um, but we've got three openings. So there are the openings uh, from the ureters, which transport urine from the kidney into the bladder. And then there is the internal urethral orifice. Uh, and this is what allows uh, urine out of the kidney and through the urethra and out the body. Uh, so uh, you can draw a, an imaginary triangle uh, between the uh, ureteral openings and this orifice down here. And this is called the uh, trigony or trigone. And then on the top of the bladder is, of course, the dome. That makes perfect sense. It looks like a dome. Okay, so bladder injury occurs in both sexes. We're going to see that this stands in contrast to urethral injury, which almost exclusively occurs in males. Bladder injury can occur in both sexes. Most commonly, it's associated with blunt trauma, uh, especially patients who have pelvic fractures. Remember that the bladder sits inside the pelvic cavity, uh, and so if there are any fractures of the pelvis, those sharp ends can go right through the bladder. Uh, and cause uh, disruption. Uh, so associated both with blunt trauma and pelvic fractures, but of course if you have penetrating trauma, uh, then uh, certainly you can get bladder injury that way too. A uh, full bladder is, uh, is, is a predisposing factor for bladder injury. If the bladder is, uh, is enlarged, if it's full, uh, that's going to make the tissue a little bit less, uh, the tissue is less dense. Think of it that way because it's spread out. And so because of that, uh, a full bladder predisposes you to uh, bladder injury if you get trauma. So in other words, the same trauma may not injure you, if, uh, may not injure your bladder if your bladder was empty versus if your bladder was full. Uh, female sex uh, predisposes you to bladder injury, and then uh, being a child predisposes you to bladder injury. So those are all risk factors. The typical presentation of bladder injury is you catheterize a patient and you get gross hematuria. So there's reddish urine coming out. Uh, and that is present in almost all patients with bladder injury. That, that doesn't mean that all patients with gross hematuria have bladder injuries, but if you have a bladder injury, almost for sure you're going to have gross hematuria. Uh, most of the time we use Foley catheters, uh, but remember uh, that you need to rule out a urethral injury before catheterizing the patient. We're going to talk about urethral injuries next, but one really good one really good way to uh, rule out a urethral injury is no blood at the urethral orifice. But another uh, good way to do that is by a specific imaging test, which may be indicated. So more about that next. Uh, when a bladder injury is suspected, so there's gross hematuria, especially in the presence of uh, pelvic fracture, the best initial diagnostic step is a retrograde cystogram. And in this case, you're instilling dye and taking pictures. This is typically done by CT, however, conventional cystogram still exists. Most of the time now, we use CT. It's just easier to do it that way. There's different uh, ways your bladder can rupture, so to speak. So most of the time, it's extra peritoneal, uh, meaning it's not in the peritoneum. Uh, and uh, usually this is due to rupture at the uh, trigony of the bladder, and that is the weakest portion of the bladder. Uh, when you see this on uh, cystogram, you'll see the contrast surrounding the bladder, and it makes perfect sense that it surrounds the bladder because it's not in the peritoneum. And in this case, you will obtain a urology consult so they can look at everything and make sure that the patient's good to go. Oftentimes, this can heal non-surgically. They will need to be in the hospital, though, usually two weeks 
Intraperitoneal rupture is a little bit less common. This is usually due to rupture at the dome of the bladder. And you think what's above the bladder? Well, there's bowel above the bladder. And so when you see this, contrast will extend into the abdomen and surround the bowel walls. And this is going to be very obvious when you see this on the cystogram. Again, obtain a urology consult. This will require surgery. And then about 5 to 12 percent of patients will have both an extraperitoneal and intraperitoneal rupture. It's important when you get a CT cystogram, and I'm not sure if the USMLE will test you on this or not, but it's good to know uh, just for your own purposes. Uh, when you get a CT cystogram, what you want to do is, and I believe probably for a conventional cystogram too, is you want to get both a picture when the patient's bladder is uh, full of contrast, when it's distended, but you also want to get another picture when the bladder is voided. And the reason is because when the bladder is distended and full of contrast, you may it may look normal, but you might be missing extravasation uh, that's really, really close to the bladder wall. Uh, so let me uh, show you uh, an example. So here is the bladder here, obviously full of contrast. And... I don't know if it shows up really good or not uh, for this one in particular, but you see uh, that there's contrast right here and kind of around here in this fascia. Uh, now, if the bladder were full, this would all be compressed and you might not be able to see that. So you need to get a, uh, this isn't a completely voided bladder, but it's good enough here to be able to diagnose that this is an extraperitoneal bladder rupture. And we don't see uh, we don't see any contrast around the bowel, and so that's important. Here's, this one's a little bit more obvious. So here's the contrast right here, and here's the bladder. Now, an intraperitoneal bladder rupture, this is a much better picture. Uh, you'll have to, when you're looking for intraperitoneal bladder rupture, you got to go a little bit further up than these pictures, these pictures were. Uh, but you want to go up just above the bladder and look to see if there's any contrast in the peritoneum. And you can see here, contrast in the peritoneum, and it's outlining bowel. Again, right here, same thing. So you'll want to go up a little further into the peritoneum to look there. But, all right. So, okay, the urethra. Now, in this is in a male, obviously. Uh, but in a female, the urethra is only like an inch or two long. It's only not much longer than probably your middle finger. Uh, so it's really short. And because of that, it's very unlikely uh, that a woman is going to ever sustain urethral damage. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? No. Most urethral injuries occur in males. And the reason is because the urethra is so much longer. Starting at the bladder, you have to have, go through a prostate gland. You also have to go then uh, through a little bit of tissue before you get to the penis, and then the penis can be of various lengths. So some men have longer ones than others, but uh, the urethra can be 7, 8, 9, 10 inches long. And so because of that, there's many opportunities for the urethra to be damaged. Now, the urethra in, in, in a female is just the urethra. That's, there's no portions. But in a male, there's various portions to the urethra. So there's the prostatic urethra, and then there's the membranous urethra, and then there's the penile urethra. So the membranous urethra is just the part that's between the prostate and the, uh, uh, the penis. Another important... Uh, area of anatomy to be familiar with is this triangular ligament here, or the urogenital ligament it can be referred to as. All right. So uh, ure urethral injuries are almost exclusively in men. It's usually due to blunt trauma or pelvic fracture. Uh, if you see it in a woman, it's probably going to be due to a pelvic fracture, a really severe pelvic fracture. The typical presentation of urethral injury is urinary urgency, of course, because if the urethra is disrupted, you're not going to be able to urinate, so that's going to cause the inability to void, and because you can't urinate, you're going to have the urgency 
to urinate, but you can't. Um, and then uh, the big one is blood at the urethral meatus. And the reason this is a big one is because not only does this uh, really point to urethral injury, but it's a very important thing to note because it tells you something that you don't want to do, and that is place a Foley catheter. So if you suspect urethral injury, do not place a Foley catheter. Other ways that you can suspect urethral injury is on the digital rectal exam. So digital rectal exam is part of any good trauma workup, and in a male, you want to feel for the prostate. Uh, so when you feel for the prostate, you should feel a nice, firm, kind of rubbery-ish uh, gland. Uh, if the prostate is non-palpable, if it's boggy, uh, which kind of a word that rhymes with it is soggy, and that's kind of what it is, uh, or if it's high riding, uh, and the reason it would be a high riding, I mean further up, uh, would be because if you got a, uh, a hematoma down here below the prostate gland, it would suspend the prostate gland up. It would be extended up because of a hematoma. And the hematoma would form because of urethral tearing. Uh, so a high riding prostate can also point to urethral injury. Uh, so it's important to both check at the urethral meatus for blood, but also to check the prostate. Another way you can uh, suspect urethral injury is if there's resistance while placing the Foley catheter. Now, it's important not to place a Foley catheter if you suspect urethral injury, but let's say that there's no blood at the urethral meatus and the prostate exam you determined was normal, and you place the Foley catheter. If there is resistance to the Foley catheter, that is suspicious for urethral injury as well. Um, so if any of these are present, if there's blood at the urethral meatus, if there's uh, abnormalities on prostate exam, uh, or there's resistance while placing a Foley catheter, and you suspect urethral injury because of the, uh, the means of the trauma, then not only do you not place a Foley catheter, but your next diagnostic step for assessing for urethral injury is going to be getting a retrograde urethrogram. And a retrograde urethrogram is just what it sounds. You are shooting up dye the opposite way that the urethra, urethra would usually conduct fluid. Uh, and you're looking for any extravasation of, uh, of, of that fluid. And if there's any extravasation, it shows you roughly where the injury is. So a normal RUG will uh, allow you to place the Foley catheter. So if it's normal, then you know that there's no damage to your urethra. You can go ahead and place a Foley catheter. If the retrograde urethrogram is abnormal, meaning there is urethral damage, we still need to catheterize the patient because they've got urine in their bladder. We need that to get out. Otherwise, we can start to go into uh, post-renal failure. But instead of a Foley catheter, which goes to the urethra, we're going to place a suprapubic catheter, uh, and that will go straight into the bladder and allow us to drain that. So there's two different ways you can get a urethral injury. It can be either posterior or anterior. And by posterior, we mean uh, behind the uh, urogenital diaphragm, urogenital ligament, or uh, uh, triangular ligament, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so the posterior urethral injury, this is uh, either, you can call it either proximal or posterior to, uh, to that ligament. And uh, this is part of either the prostatic or membranous urethra. So let's go back here. So here you've got membranous urethra uh, here, uh, and, then, uh, and then you've got prostatic urethra. Okay. Um, yeah, so here's your membranous urethra and prostatic urethra. This is like a 115-year-old illustration. So it's amazing we're still using this. Okay, um, let's go back here. All right, so injury to the prostatic or membranous urethra, this is most commonly associated with pelvic fractures. Um, this is a little bit more common than the anterior urethral injury. Uh, for diagnosis, just like any urethral injury, we do this via retrograde uh, urethrogram, and uh, we would see extravasation of contrast superior to the urogenital diaphragm. So, makes sense if we have injury of the prostatic urethra or the membranous urethra, 
the blood is going to go uh, superior to the urogenital diaphragm or proximal to the urogenital diaphragm. Uh, the treatment is going to be to place a suprapubic catheter to drain the bladder. You'll want to get a CT cystogram because damage to the posterior urethra is highly associated with damage to the bladder. And then, of course, you'll obtain a urology consult. You're not responsible for knowing the exact treatment for this. Just know you need to call urology. 35% of posterior urethral injuries are associated also with bladder injuries. So that's why getting the CT cystogram is important. The anterior urethral injury is exclusively in men. Uh, this is injury to the penile urethra, and this is most commonly due to straddle injuries, uh, penetrating trauma to the penis, ouch, and iatrogenic causes such as instrumentation, i.e. a Foley catheter. So the symptoms here are going to be uh, in addition to your typical symptoms of urethral injury, you can have a hematoma along the penile shaft. Um, and if this uh, breaks Buck's fascia, this can extend into the abdominal wall and down into the scrotum, because remember, your scrotum is consistent with your peritoneum. Uh, and this can give you what's called a butterfly hematoma. Um, so it may or may not penetrate Buck's fascia, um, but if it does, it will extend down into the scrotum most of the time. Otherwise, it's just a hematoma along the penile shaft because this is uh, an injury to the penile urethra. For diagnosis, again, like any urethral injury, you get a retrograde urethrogram, and it will show you extravasation of contrast material inferior to the urogenital diaphragm because now we're distal to the urogenital diaphragm. Treatment here, just like uh, posterior urethral injury, except for the fact that here we're not, su we're not really suspecting bladder injury. So you'll just place the suprapubic catheter and get a urology consult. And this is an example of the butterfly hematoma. So in this case, there was uh, an injury to the urethra, and the injury was enough to penetrate Buck's fascia and blood then uh, extended down through the peritoneum. And uh, the closest peritoneal space to the penis is the scrotum. And so there's blood, there's a scrotal hematoma here. And you also see hematoma of the surrounding skin.